Uh, today I have the honor of introducing Marty Seidenfeld uh, of the Final Exit Network. Uh, death to me is something that is as important as the life that we lead. And so it's important that we as human beings exit in all the pomp and circumstance that we come into this world with. Um, Dr. Seinfeld is a native of New York City, now living in Boise, Idaho. He is a graduate of the City University of New York and earned a PhD in psychology from Boston University. He is an experienced clinical psychologist, organizational consultant, university professor, and seminar leader, and has presented programs in all 50 states as well as overseas. A past president of the Idaho Psychological Association, he is well known for his publications. As Dr. Marty, he conducted a popular Boise radio show. Uh, please join me in a great HSGT welcome for Dr. Marty Seidenfeld. Thank you, Ron, and hello, everybody. <laughs> hello. hello. Just want to make sure you're out there. Okay. Um, as Ron mentioned, I am a psychologist, um, a New Yorker. I was back there last week. I missed the big city. Uh, tough to get around. Boise's a lot easier, but that was good. I'm here to talk about death. I know that's a jolly subject that we're all very interested in. It turns out to be very difficult. People do not like to talk about death. I got bad news. The bad news is you're all going to die. Except for me. <laughs> Denial is alive and well when we talk about death. It's easier to talk about finances or your sex life or your health or almost anything else. People just do not like talking about death. But our plan for today is to talk about death, about the end of life uh, in America. Let me tell you about my personal... There's somebody sneaking up behind me here. <laughs> Let me tell you about my uh, <laughs> involvement with this thing. Um, I attended a talk, just like you folks are now, and there was a, a guy talking from the Final Exit Network, and it sounded interesting, and I listened and enjoyed it and promptly forgot about it. But several years later, I had a little incident. I have a, a cat, a pussy cat. Uh, it was my wife's. My wife passed away, and it became my pussy cat. And my pussy cat would always come and greet me when I came home from the office, and then I noticed it stopped doing so, and it just sort of lay there curled up and uh, was unresponsive, and I worried about her, and so I went to the vet, and the vet examined her, and in fact said uh, she has a, a kind of a cancer, and she's, uh, I asked, do you think she's in pain? And she was quite elderly for a cat, and he said, probably so. And he looked at me, and I looked at him, and he said, yeah, it's time to, to euthanize her. And so I made an appointment, and I came back the next day, and I held her in my arms, and I stroked her, and I talked to her, and the doctor took a needle and uh, injected into her a vein, and she quickly died. And I'm thinking, gee, they couldn't do that to my mother. What a shame. Didn't seem right. And then I recalled the talk I had been to and I said, well, I'm going to find out more about that group, the Final Exit Network, and I did. And I became involved, and I got myself trained as an exit guide. I'll talk more about that, and later became a member of the board, and <laughs> as you might guess, part of the Speakers Bureau. That's what I'm doing here. Um, so today, I'm going to show you a very brief video for just a few minutes, and then we're going to talk about why this subject is relevant and very important talk about the legalities involved in the Death with Dignity movement, and then talk more specifically about the Final Exit Network and, and how we work. And I hope we'll have a chance for question, answer, and discussion. So I'd like to show the first five minutes of this. Make it go. <laughs> Make it go, number one. <laughs>
my friends. I'm Derek Humphrey. I founded the Hemlock Society in 1980, and amongst other books, wrote that best-selling volume in 1991 called Final Exit, The Practicalities of Self-Deliverance and Assisted Suicide for the Dying. What I'm going to talk to you about on this short video is the new and up-to-date version of this book. But first, let me set the atmosphere of this whole difficult subject by telling you briefly the story of how I helped my own first wife to her end when she was dying of cancer. What Jean did is described in a little book called Jean's Way, and it has more or less set the broad standard in the following 20 years for the practice of accelerated death by people with terminal illness. When Jean realized that her breast cancer was spreading into the bones and she was not likely to live much longer, she thought the matter over and came to me with a proposition, which was, when the time comes and I am close to death, if the pain and indignity are unbearable to me, I would like to kill myself. But I need your help. If you are willing, please go to a doctor and ask for lethal medications which we can keep until that time comes. I can only stand so much pain and stress, she said, and I know I will want to hasten the end. Instinctively, I agreed to help. This was truly a death by request. Fortunately, I knew a courageous doctor who understood Jean's situation and provided me with the deadly drugs. I told her that I had them stashed away. Jean didn't want to die. She was 42. So she battled on for another 10 months until the cancer invaded all her vital organs. She kept fighting to live. When she was taking so many painkillers just to get an hour of comfort, when she could no longer get to the bathroom on her own, and when her bones were breaking spontaneously, she asked me one morning, is this the day? I knew, of course, what she was asking. Had the time come to end it? Our original pact the previous year had stipulated that it would be a joint decision in case her judgment was clouded with the numerous drugs she was taking to survive. When I agreed that her end was close, she stated, I shall die at one o'clock. She had said goodbye to our teenage sons, whom she had discreetly told of her plans the previous morning. We spent quality time together, going over the past and the future, and if she had not mentioned again that she wanted to die, I would not have brought it up. But right on one o'clock, she said, look at the time, go and get it. I went into the kitchen and mixed the lethal drugs into a large mug of coffee, laced it with plenty of sugar to reduce the bitter taste. When I returned to her bedside, Jean said, is that it? Yes, I told her, drink that and you will die. I got on the bed and we enjoyed a last hug and a kiss then I sat down beside her as she lifted the mug to her lips. She gulped the liquid down rapidly. Then she just had time to say, goodbye, my love, before she passed out. 50 minutes later, she was dead. Wouldn't it be nice if we could all die that way, quickly and painlessly, surrounded by those we love, instead of in a hospital or in a nursing home with tubes and wires running in and out of us? Well, Derek Humphrey was the founder of a number of organizations that eventually led to the Final Exit Network, and uh, of which I'm, I'm a member. We're all gonna die, and I think as intelligent people, we know, uh, in poll after poll, people were asked uh, what you want from death. And we want to be die quickly and painlessly, surrounded by people we love. Over 70% of the American population who answered a good poll had that position. However, what most of us get is we die in a nursing home or in a hospital with wires and tubes and pinging machines all over us surrounded by strangers, well-meaning, good people, but strangers. And it's not the choice that we would make. 
It's become an increasingly important issue because the largest growing segment of our population in America and the Western world is the elderly. And I look around here, I see a lot of gray hair uh, or no hair. And I'm getting to the no hair stage, running out of gray. <laughs> and uh, so it becomes more and more of a, of a pressing issue. The underlying problem, and it is a social problem, is whose life is it? Now, if you ask very religious people, they'll tell you it's God's life. But thank, th I was going to say thank God. <laughs> I'm with a group of people here who believe in, in humans. Uh, it's humans have to deal with problems that we deal with and, and not some other worldly creature. Um, for humanists who believe that humans have to solve our problems and, and deal with our issues rather than someone else, What's most important are each person's own wishes, and that's what's important. The most common reason that people choose to end their lives is usually because of, it's not pain, it's usually because of a loss of personal autonomy. How do you feel when you, you know, we spend all our childhood and youth growing up trying to become independent. I don't need you to care for me, Daddy. Uh, and then we become independent. And then we become uh, probably heads or parts of families and we raise our dependent children. And, and now we find ourselves becoming dependent again because of our illness. And we can't take care of ourselves. How do you feel if you can't walk and depend on other people to push you around? Or you can't handle things well, or you just don't feel well. A loss of personal dignity was cited by over 91% of the people who came to us for aid in dying. Let me, you don't have to know these figures, but I'll just give you some idea. Another 89% came to us because they just could not enjoy life anymore. You know, I dealt with one man who was in his 90s, he had been uh, active in World War II. He was a, uh, a brilliant kind of guy. And he said, you know, I can't even enjoy my food anymore. I go to the movies and it's all crap, end quote. And he couldn't enjoy himself anymore. And he said, it's time to go. Everybody who I've ever known and loved, they're gone. I don't want to live anymore. It was his life. Loss of personal dignity, about 50% of the people who come to us came specifically because they could not control their body functions. They needed help to go to the bathroom. Isn't that a, a fun thing to think about, that you can't use the gun by yourself? Um, pretty discouraging. Another 40% gave us their prime reason, their lack of uh, uh, autonomy and the burden they were to other people because they saw how their adult children were maybe giving up their jobs or other responsibilities in order to care for them or spending more money than they really could to put them in a, in a nursing facility or other kinds of facilities. <clears throat> About a quarter of the people who came to us for assisted death were because of actual pain, fear of pain or lack of good control of their pain. Only about 3%, that's a very small percent, came to us because of the financial burden of treatment that was eaten up, whatever they had uh, managed to accumulate over their lifetime of work. <clears throat> What's missing was the right to die for people with painful and distressing conditions, not necessarily within six months to live. The first law in the United States regarding uh, assistance in dying was in Oregon, thanks to Derek Humphrey, who we just saw on this little video. <clears throat> and there were all kinds of restrictions on who could die because there was a great fear. Oh, we're going to go around killing people, huh? And you needed lots of reassurance and safeguards that, in fact, this would strictly be a voluntary thing. First of all, there was a requirement that the person had to be a resident of the state. They had to have a prognosis that said they had less than six months to live. They were very likely to die within the next six months. They had to make an initial oral request to their doctor and then a second request at least 15 days later. I want to make sure it was not an impulsive thing. It was well thought out and the person was determined to do it 
even a couple of weeks after having first initiated the process. The attending physician has to wait at least 48 hours between the, the, the request the person makes and getting a written request from them saying, please help me die. Two physicians had to testify. The person had to be proven to be sound mentally. They knew what they were doing. They knew what they were asking for. And the two witnesses had to be there who could not be uh, relatives or a treating physician or employees of any nursing home. This was the first law in the United States that actually came into effect in 1997. Uh, the state of Washington followed not too long after that. There are problems with the law. For example, from the time of the first request until the person actually died in Oregon, the average time was 77 days. In Washington, it was 88 days. That's almost three months from the time a person came to usually a very difficult decision to come to, it's time to end my life. They had to wait, on the average, three months, which might have been three months of unbearable pain, loss of dignity, all the things that I mentioned. What did people die from? Well, a lot of different things, but about three quarters of the people who chose to end their lives voluntarily were dying of cancer. About another 8% were dying of neurodegenerative diseases, ALS, and Parkinson's, and similar kinds of conditions. Um, another 20% from various kinds of things, heart conditions, respiratory conditions, all kinds of other things that were making their lives unbearable. <clears throat> How to end it. The American Association of Suicide Ideology recognizes that physician-assisted death is distinct from what's called suicide. They work to prevent suicides. Uh, I myself have been involved in establishing a suicide hotline where I live in Idaho. Um, suicide is usually, you know, we're all familiar with Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. You know, uh, I can't stand to live without my partner. <coughs> or the businessman loses all his money in the market or his business goes downhill and he decides to walk out the window of the 30th floor office. Those are suicides. We're talking about something really different. Um, we're talking about, like Derek Humphrey's wife, People suffering from a terminal illness, they don't want to die. They want to live. But they ain't got no choice. They're dying from some disease. The only question is, how are they going to die? Not whether they're going to die, but how are they going to die, which is a question for all of us, but it becomes very prominent when we're in a terminally ill kind of condition. Suicide is psychic pain and despair when people can't enjoy life. But of course, the guy who loses his girlfriend or his business or whatever, things can change. I dare say that most of us here have experienced very sad and unfortunate events and we felt very, very blue. But we survived, things got better. We discovered there were other loves that we could develop. There were other businesses, there were other things we could do, there were other ways we could enjoy life. So we do not want to deal with people who are hurting because of some unfortunate thing. There's also a significant financial interest in this whole subject. Healthcare, as you know, has gotten to be very, very expensive. In 2015, which was the last year I have specific data for, Medicare paid 55 billion, that's with a B, for doctor and hospital bills during the last two months of patients' lives. That is a lot of money. It is more than they've paid for homeland security or education or almost anything else. And in at least, it's hard to figure, but the best estimates are that in about a quarter of the cases, it had no meaningful impact. The people were dying anyway. So the money was spent, doctors and hospitals, uh, collected the money, and the people died anyway. 
Dying is very expensive. In an ICU, it can cost up to 10 grand a day to keep you alive with all those machines and the high technology and the constant watching. And some will stay there for days or weeks or even months in an intensive care unit. Uh, needless suffering. If you've had a successful life financially and you've managed to accumulate something and you'd like to leave it to your children, well, if you're gonna go into an ICU and be kept alive for some while, they ain't gonna get it. It's gonna go to the, to the medical hospital industry. I don't mean to be sounding negative towards them. They're doing what they're trained to do, which is try and help and keep people alive. I'm not sure it's the right thing for people to choose to do. And if you want your kids to inherit, then you have to avoid spending all that money in the less the very end of your life. <clears throat> Whose decision is it whether you should live or die? Opponents of medical aid in dying, MAID, that's a nice little acronym, M-A-I-D. You're MAID, medical aid in dying, or medical assistance in dying. Usually, the opposition comes from religion. Every day is a gift from God. <laughs> well, it's nice to be among some people who see things differently. <clears throat> but those religious people have very, very important uh, pull in our, in our society. Uh, this is their faith statement, that it's God's will to let us live or die. And you can agree with that, or you can disagree with that. But I don't want you telling me what your belief is should govern how I can live or die. And that, of course, is the, is the political issue, and I'm sure you folks here are all very familiar with that. But the fact is that religious faith is very often the basis for public policy. And it shouldn't be. Um, it was absolutely opposed by our founding fathers, uh, but nonetheless, Religious people have a powerful effect upon our laws and our society. When discussing a good end of life with a patient, there was, this has been studied, doctors talked about five or six minutes with their patients about end of life. That's not a long time. They spend a lot more time talking about a broken arm or a kidney that's not working or a heart that's problematic. And during those five or six minutes, the doctor did two-thirds of the talking. Much better at talking than listening. And maybe that's not such a good thing. And they never raised issue about the claimants, or the, excuse me, the patient's preferences or desires. They never asked what they wanted done. They talked to them for two-thirds of that five or six minutes about death without asking them what they wanted. If the patient is too sick to make decisions, they wanted the family members to make the choices. A minority wanted the doctor to make the choices without consulting them. You tell me what to do, doctor. That was a minority. Most people, adults, were autonomous. We want to make our own decisions. Doctors, by and large, are trained. Death is the enemy. It is to be fought bought off and avoided at all costs, no matter how long, whatever it takes. Death is the enemy, a patient dies, it's their failure. Nobody wants to fail, and so they do all they can, even when cure is not possible, to keep you alive. They get very uncomfortable when they have to talk about death, uh, talk about choices, for example, you want hospital versus treatment at home. Do you want a breathing machine or feeding tubes or just comfort care? They don't like to talk about those things very much. Many doctors are not experts in symptom management and emotional support. They are dealing, by and large, lots of exceptions, but by and large, with the body and its physiological functioning. And they have to do everything tiptoe dog like regardless of the pain or suffering involved. Fear that offering just comfort care 
not cure, not treatment of the condition, but just trying to keep, keep the, uh, the patient comfortable. Fear that if they just offer that, suggests that they've given up and failed. As if they can keep you alive forever. And we know that ain't gonna happen. There's this real unreality that exists within the medical community. <coughs> medical education usually does not include, it's getting better, a lot of concern about palliative care, learning just how to help people be comfortable, and compassionate care near the end of life. For physicians and their patients, talking about dying is taboo. Now, we're going to fix you up, you're going to get better. The American Psych Association, my group, I'm a psychologist, they published something called an end-of-life care fact sheet to deal with the questions and what are the mental health needs of older people near the end of life? Well, the APA, American Psych Association, did not take a formal position on physician-assisted death in states where it is legal. It recognizes that there are different perspectives on the issue. People who do choose voluntary death about 70% occurred in people who were 65 years or older. Um, not surprising. By and large, older people want better discussion and information and a chance to influence their decisions about their own ends of life, whether they want to die at home or in a hospital, what they can choose or not, um, whether they want to die in institutions. Most are referred too late to hospice and palliative care that Ron works with, I know, so they don't get all the benefits that they might have if they had been more realistic in asking for hospice care earlier on. People fear their death, the symptoms, anxiety, emotional suffering, and their family concerns often get ignored. Uh, many who die in hospitals still receive unwanted and distressing treatments. Uh, often they have prolonged pain, but they keep on getting treatment. It's important for each of us to have an advanced directive for health care in which we very clearly state this is what I want when I'm at certain stages, um, and this is what I do not want. And if it is done properly and signed, and you want to be extra careful, maybe have it notarized, it should be adhered to by the hospital or physicians caring for you, but it often is not. That's the sad fact. Um, hospitals don't want much to do with it. Uh, the Catholics in America have a wonderful system of hospitals, um, get great care at, at many Catholic hospitals. In many communities, it's the only hospital, and they refuse to go along with anything to aid in dying. It's against their religious belief, which is imposed upon all of their patients, like it or not. Uh, in some cases, it's the only hospital, it's the only game in town, and so they're, they're sort of stuck with that. They fear that their advanced directives will be disregarded and they face death alone often in misery. <laughs> Doctors often use vague and confusing terms, only very briefly talk about therapy options when the patient is too sick to participate. There have been a lot of legal developments <coughs> in America since 1997 when the first law about aid in dying went into effect in Oregon, thanks to, to Derek largely. There's been a lot of what's called terminal sedation. People are given medicines to sedate them so that they can ease their pain and so on. But of course, it's dangerous. Morphine is a very dangerous drug. And so what's happened is doctors who may be very compassionate will prescribe the medicines and they'll say, be very careful with this. If you take too much, it'll kill you. <laughs> but they have to be careful because it would be malpractice, serious, if they instructed people to kill themselves. So it's a really screwy thing, uh, situation that fosters hypocrisy. And it's not a good thing. <clears throat> they have endorsed 
VSED, voluntary suspension of eating and dying, which is one way of eating and drinking, <laughs> excuse me, which is one way people can choose to die. Um, it's an option. I think, it's, personally, I think it's a terrible option. Um, one guy in Australia who I met wrote a book about, a couple of books about it, and he talks about how his mother uh, chose voluntary cessation of eating and drinking, and she withered away, and she was miserable for a long time before she finally gave up the ghost, if you'll pardon the Dutch language, and uh, she died. Um, under some of our state and legal constitutions, anything fostering death is a no-no. However, prevailing law for the past 20 years has upheld state bans on lethal poisons as a mode of protecting the vulnerable pop population. Hey, sister, let's knock off mom and get that inheritance now. Because she could linger on for who knows how long, and I want that money now. That's a fear. Maybe it's realistic, maybe it's not. It's probably realistic in some cases. Or, she's such a burden. We've got to have nurses just gobbling up all of I'm spending all my time taking care of, of dear old dad. You know, what a pain in the butt. Um, let's knock them off now, just overdose them real quickly. So, you know, these are vulnerable people. Or <coughs> a, uh, a child with some serious medical conditions so that they can't lead a normal life is just a, a burden. Parents may feel, <coughs> excuse me, that's the humane thing to do. And so they'll arrange to let them die or to more actively bring about their deaths to kill them. So there's laws protecting people from vulnerable deaths, vulnerable people from deaths. Uh, so it's a very difficult situation because that is a real problem. I think it's grossly exaggerated, but I think it is a, a real problem. So let me tell you about the final exit network, <coughs> of which I'm a member. We are an all-volunteer organization. We have no paid people. We've got a secretary assistant in office, and she gets paid, but all of our people, we've got about 3,000 members, are volunteers. What happens is that somebody, one of you, calls our office. The phone number is on your little brochure as I hand it out to you, or that Ron handed out to you. We'll call them, and you'll speak to somebody who you call a coordinator. And You'll say, they'll say, what's up? And you'll say, I want to die. And they'll say, why do you want to die? And they'll say, because I'm suffering from Parkinson's or whatever. They will ask you to send them a letter outlining your choice about why you want to die and making clear that this is your choice and nobody else's. They will also ask you to send in your medical records. So you'll go to your doctor and you'll ask them to send the records to the final exit network. <coughs> and those records will go to a group of physicians in our organization, and they will either pass on it and say, yes, this person is very, very seriously and probably unbearably ill, or not. Assuming that the, our physician, our medical evaluation committee, group of physicians, uh, agree that this person is a very likely candidate We'll set up a telephone interview, and we'll talk with that person over the phone. By the way, we operate in all 50 states. Um, and so we call that person, and we make sure that they, you know, the first question, or well, not the first question, but a question that is con constantly asked and re-asked, are you sure you want to do this? Mm -hmm. It's not a whim. It's not an impulsive thing. And we repeatedly do that. Um, have you thought about when you want to die? Have you thought about members of your family, how they feel about this? Have you thought about what you want in the way of funeral arrangements or cremation, all kinds of other issues that are involved with uh, people who are dying? Chico. <coughs> Man is ready. <laughs> Thanks, Ron. 
assuming all goes well from that interview, and it looks like a very legitimate case, then a senior guide is assigned to meet with that person. Uh, I happen to be a senior guide, and I'll work together with an associate guide, who's kind of an apprentice, and we will go and meet with that person at their home, wherever they are, in any of our 50 states, and we will say, <laughs> are you sure you want to do this? Again and again, and then, assuming that it goes well, we would then show them how to achieve a quick and painless death at a time of their choosing. And we would ask, who do you want to be present at the time of your death? And they would say, my spouse, or my adult son or daughter, or nobody, but it's up to them, of course. And we will rehearse with them. The technique we're using now, mostly, has to do with um, an inert gas. Inert meaning that it's not a, uh, a chemical thing. We show them how to build a little hood and get a tank of, well, we were, had been using helium for a long time. Helium, uh, as you know, is what's used to fill up the kids' balloons at parties so that they, they throw it up because it's lighter than air. Um, <coughs> so we would buy, get them to buy a tank of helium from a party goods store and show them how to uh, attach a tube to it, to a hood that they're wearing over their head, so that when they turn the gas, the helium gas on, it would fill the uh, hood, and so they would not be getting any oxygen. Now, helium is not poisonous, and they're not suffocating because they can breathe regularly, but they're not getting any oxygen. And without any oxygen, your brain dies very quickly. And there's usually a loss of consciousness, 15, 20, 30 seconds. And they are, as a person, in terms of thinking, brain function, gone. Bodies are very resilient, and the heart and lung system will keep on functioning for, depending on their state of health, for another 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes. I don't think ever longer than 30 minutes or so. You take the pulse and this gone. Uh, some while ago, maybe three, four years ago, the helium manufacturers decided to <laughs> stop selling tanks of pure helium and diluted it with 10% air, which meant that if we were to use that, the person would still be breathing some oxygen. Why they did that, I do not know. My guess is they can get the same price for giving only 90% of their product. So, but I don't know why they did that. But they did that. So it became unsuitable for our use, and so we switched to nitrogen gas. Um, as many of you, I'm sure, know, nitrogen is about 70% of the air that we're breathing right now. It's uh, non-poisonous. It's just a major component of normal air. It's a little bit more complicated because you have to, it usually comes in uh, tanks that need regulators and so on, but it's not real complicated either. So that's what we, we use. <coughs> So we meet with them, we go over everything, we show them how to do it, and then we ask, when do you want to die? By the way, it has been somewhat difficult for me and for many people to talk about it. We say, when do you want to pass away? Or when would you like to exit this world? Instead of, you know, when do you want to be dead? Because that's what we're talking about. And not the time for illusions or pretty talk, but to be very direct and serious and understanding. And we get various answers. Well, I want to wait until after one more Christmas, because I love Christmas time. Okay. I want to wait until after my granddaughter is going to graduate from high school in this, uh, this June, and I'd like to wait for that, till after that. Okay. It's not our decision. Very often the decision is, I want to die now. I'm ready. Please let me die. Um, we will say, think about it, and we require at least a day or two. So that it's not something impulsive. It's usually not at that point, but we want to be extra, extra careful. <clears throat> and then we come back for our second meeting, the senior guide and the associate guide. And we again ask, are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> and of course, by this point, they're all very sure. 
and they go ahead and do it, and they die. I might mention that uh, for me personally, and for all the other guys, it's been a very, very uh, moving and powerful and positive experience to help people end their suffering. It's not that they want to die, people, it's that they don't have any choice, they are dying. We all know we're dying, and it's not so much death that we fear, but it's the dying process. We don't want to be lying up miserably, helpless, maybe in pain for some unknown length of period, uh, period of time. It would be nice, wouldn't it, to be able to die like our clients, quickly and painlessly, at home, in the company of those we choose to have with us, and not others. Strangers, well-meaning strangers. I think that the right to choose our own deaths, the death with dignity movement is the overall umbrella title that we have. I think that it is a very important issue for our time. As humanists, we can look at a variety of gains in humanism over the last few hundred years. And I thought about this. Um, 1776. Declaration of Independence, we did a very, very radical thing. We decided we don't need a king ordained by God to rule us. We were going to let humans choose our rulers. And that was a huge step forward for humanity, I think. No king, no king chosen by God. People will choose their own leaders. 1863, Emancipation Proclamation. Slavery is not allowed. All those people are humans also. You can't own other human beings. And the slaves in America were freed. Early in the 20th century, we said, guess what? Women are human. Let's them vote too. <laughs> that might have been a mistake. <laughs> 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 sorry, folks, sorry. <laughs> And so, again, another humanistic advancement. In the 60s, uh, as we're all aware, I'm sure, a lot of uh, having to do with racial equality, and that still goes on. And then the LGBT movement, which is very active now, gender equality. I think perhaps the biggest, most imp not biggest, but most important issue for the 21st century, because of the graying of America, is going to be the death with dignity movement. Uh, more and more people are concerned about this. As I mentioned, the largest segment, or the most rapidly growing segment of our population is the very old, the very elderly. And as we mature, we have to think about end of life. So, I'm going to ask you all, this is my pitch. I hope you will join us. There's a handy little application form on those little brochures that Ron hands it out. Um, you join us, you'll get our newsletter, help you be aware of the issues that are going on. And frankly, we need your support. I flew down from Boise to speak with you at no charge to your organization because the final legislator paid my freight, which was nice. <coughs> As a guide, I will wherever I'm needed and again, there's never any charge to anybody using our services at all. So we need financial support in this real world. Money talks, no news to you, is it? So we hope that you'll join us. All of our funding is done by membership and donations and requests. More important reasons, or at least as important, is compassion that you feel for people who need to die. This is a way of helping people in a very compassionate, important kind of way for their end of life. And you or your loved ones may need our, our services. It's important and it's right. So I hope you'll support us. Um, by the way, if you know of any other groups that will be interested in learning about us, uh, please let me know, because we'll arrange to come talk with them. I think that's about what I have to say 
what I'd like to do is ask questions, discussion. This lady. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, that's a very good presentation. Thank you. I'd like to ask you, is nitrogen just as quick as helium was? Say again, please. Is nitrogen just as quick as helium was? Uh, I'm sorry, my hearing's not great and the voice just comes a little blurry to me. Okay. Ron, could you repeat it? Yeah, is nitrogen as quick as helium is? Yes, because again, neither the helium nor the nitrogen is poison. All that it is is that the, in the hood that the person is wearing, it replaces the oxygen, so they're not getting any oxygen. So there's no poison involved. There's nothing toxic. It's just a lack of oxygen. Yes, sir? Has your organization had any lawsuits at all? Has our organization had any lawsuits? Yes, several. Uh, ambitious, well, we got a really weird legal situation. Uh, years ago, it was done away. Suicide is not a crime. Assisting suicide in many states is a crime. So you have legally a really paradoxical, what I would call screwy situation, where it's a crime to help somebody do something that's not a crime. <laughs> Go figure. But, so in several states, there have been attempts by ambitious attorneys general to, uh, uh, to convict us of assisting suicide. Um, they did that in Georgia, they did it in Arizona, and in both cases, they lost. We claim that we do not assist. What we do is we inform, we educate people, and in fact, our guys are trained. We do not, in fact, do the physical assistance of turning the valve on with your breathing the killing death blow, hand people a cup of uh, poison. Uh, so we do not assist. We go by our, our uh, Fourth Amendment rights, freedom of speech. And we point out that the information we're giving, they can get out of a book in a library or online or any place else. Nonetheless, we recently were convicted in Minnesota uh, for assisting death, for enabling a suicide. It's a little screwy. It's, being, it's under appeal now. So it's hard to know, but so far, nobody's gone to jail. Uh, we think that we're absolutely right, and I think the tide of public opinion, which eventually will lead legal opinion, is, is turning in our direction. But it is problematic. And, and I'd be glad to help bail you out. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> A very con uh, conservative, conservative estimate is that 30,000 people die from firearms in this country every year, 500 accidental shootings, 10,000 homicides, and 20,000 suicides. How many people a year are choosing self-assist or physician-assisted uh, exit every yeah, year? It's, it's really hard to know. The numbers are, are not great. Um, I did see some numbers recently. There are several states now I'm, gonna, I'm not going to ignore you, but I want to go a little digression. There are several states that have legalized physician-assisted uh, dying. Uh, as I mentioned, Oregon was the first, followed by Washington. Not too many years later, California, and then Vermont, uh, most recently Hawaii and the District of Columbia all have laws um, legalizing physician-assisted death. There are active campaigns now in New Jersey and in Pennsylvania and in New York and in, in uh, New Mexico and Montana and in a number of different states. So I think it's going to become a, uh, a national kind of thing. As to the actual numbers of people who do this, who die, we don't know because we don't know how many doctors say, be careful with this medicine, it'll kill you. But doctors often are compassionate people and they, they help. <coughs> <coughs> as far as using our uh, services, it comes to several hundred a year. Not much, but several hundred every year who come to us to ask for um, aid in dying. Um, this is a little bit off topic. About 20 years ago I read that Dr. Kevorkian had a, a really great idea. He talked to people who were sentenced to die in prisons and asked them if they wanted to be organ donors. 
And the statistics were really high, like over 90% said absolutely. It was not allowed because for the doctor to administer whatever killed the patient made the doctor in violation of the Hippocratic Oath. I don't know if anything ever came of that, but I thought it was a good <coughs> idea. Excuse so I'm wondering if you know. Uh, I don't know the answer specifically to that question, but as part of our interview, we do ask people if they've thought about volunteering their bodies, because we think that's probably a good thing to do. By the way, <coughs> since you mentioned uh, Jack Kevorkian, he has been a very controversial figure because he was a bit of a clown in some ways. Um, and he brought sort of a bad smell to what he was doing. And he was actually, <coughs> excuse me, was actually killing people, throwing the little switch on his death machine. <coughs> Can I have that? I beg your pardon, everyone. I got a little cold. Thank you. But he did raise consciousness of people about the issue that there are a lot of people who are choosing to die for probably good and sufficient reason and not just impulsive emotional suicides. Um, we do ask people if they wish to do that and there's no coercion, there's never any push of any sort, but it's something that's part of the interview process, one of the things that uh, you think people should think about and they decide what they decide. Are you, are you there at the time they actually die? Yes. Uh, not too long ago, I dealt with a woman who had uh, no family at all. And <clears throat> when she was ready to die, she reached out. She wanted me to hold her hand. So I did. So I held her hand while she died. Uh, we are present to make sure that the thing is done correctly and that there is no suffering of any kind. So, yes, we are present at the time of death. In your list of, uh, hi. Hi. In your list of uh, people that are requesting your services, there was no mention of Alzheimer's dementia. And that is one of the leading uh, things that leaves you dependent on other people. Are, uh, there must be thinking on this in your group, how to approach that subject. That's a very, very difficult subject. Um, because one of our requirements is that the person be of sound mind and so they know that what they're doing and yet a person uh, who suffers from significant dementia, Alzheimer's or some other type of dementia may not be of sound mind. We've been trying to deal with that and it is difficult but we ask people, I hope all of you will have a, uh, a living will uh, a, uh, in which you state under what conditions you would wish to stop living. And if you have it done properly, it should be respected. For example, <laughs> in my case, I might say, if I can stop enjoying my martinis, <laughs> then it's time to go. And if I can't enjoy a football, if I can't use the bathroom independently, if I don't recognize my own children, then I wish to end my life. But there are still, uh, issues about that and it is not clear and has not been clarified and it is a sad thing um, that I think that many people miss the opportunity because they fail to provide a living will and I hope you all will think about making sure that you have a living will and you give a power of attorney to somebody it's called the power of attorney for health care uh, to somebody a, a spouse an adult child or someone who you will see who would see to it that your final wishes are uh, adhered to. By the way, uh, when you join us, part of our membership is we provide you the necessary forms that you would need to make sure that you can do that right. That's one of our minor benefits. Somebody back there? Hi. Uh, I, uh, I wondered how your group handles, there are illnesses uh, that are not terminal but cause severe pain that require uh, the patient to take extraordinary amounts of medication just to handle the pain and then put them into a state where their quality of life is very bad. Yeah. How, how do you handle when someone like that um, approaches you for help? Our medical uh, evaluation committee does not simply look at the name of the condition 
nor at their prognosis, but rather do they have events or a combination of events that is making their life unbearable. The main thrust of our organization is to believe in well, it's called death with dignity, and people's independent choices. If they had feel they've had enough, who am I to say it's not? So it's up to the, we respect the individual's wishes, so long as they're of reasonably sound mind, they know what they're doing. So, uh, well, you saw the, the video here, and uh, the wife found her life to be unbearable. She might have lived for another year, becoming increasingly incapacitated because of the, the cancer. But she decided to die, and we, we accept that. We think that's enough, and that's good. We don't decide that. We respect people's individual's opinion, but we remind them if they're suffering from a severe, I had a good friend who was uh, diagnosed with ALS, a neurodegenerative condition, Lou Gehrig's disease, and he became increasingly debilitated, and uh, it was painful. This was many, many years ago, to watch him slowly degenerate. This was a very, very active guy. He and I had worked together <laughs> as waiters in resort hotels, and we were hustlers, and we did all kinds of things. And he was becoming a helpless blob sitting in a wheelchair until finally he died. People shouldn't have to do that. And it's up to them to decide, nobody else. That's our feeling. Sir. Are there states that are causing, creating problems for your organization? And if so, what states are they? Um, well, I, I mentioned two states where we actually were brought to court, or three states, the other one being Minnesota, which is actively being litigated at this point. Um, yet we operate in all 50 states. We've had no other problems than the other 47. So it's hard to know. But there will be some ambitious attorney general who will say, here's my chance to get my name in the papers and I'm going to rally all the religious people to show what devils these people are. And I expect that that will happen. We have, we're very, very fortunate to have uh, among our members some excellent lawyers who work with us on a volunteer basis. By the way, we are all, I may have mentioned this, sorry if I repeat myself, we're an all volunteer organization. Nobody makes a dime out of this business. We do this because we believe it's right. Uh, we are supported by your contributions and memberships and bequests. Sometimes people had a lovely experience where a, <coughs> a man died and he left a bequest. His family was so grateful, he left us uh, five figures, lots of, lots of money, which, which was used to send people like me on airplanes to come talk to people like you. <laughs> <laughs> and also to send us to, uh, to bedside of people who are dying to serve as guides. If I can just put in a plug, um, I don't know that there's any training currently available in the Phoenix area, but you do have John Abraham down in Tucson who does uh, Final Exit Network training about once a month. My hearing is not good, so I'm going to ask, could you clarify that for me, Ron? You were right there. John Abrahams in Tucson does yes. Final Exit training yes. once a month. Oh yeah, John uh, is a wonderful contributor to our organization, and he works with people all around the state of Arizona, especially he happens to, I think, live in Tucson. Uh, we have members in all 50 states, uh, and a little brochure, this is our board of directors, and you'll see I'm from Idaho, not the most progressive state in the world, uh, but there we are. <laughs> oh. Question? Oh, you know, you don't have to have a degenerative disease like cancer. I, I can't to see who's, who's speaking. Oh, hi oh, there. <laughs> You don't have to have a, degener a degenerative disease to be in pain. My mother was just dying of old age at 89, and she was in hospice, and it was a really high-class hospice that was associated with Hogue Memorial Hospital in Newport Beach. You think she'd get the best care, but she just lingered for over a year there, and when I'd come to visit her, I could tell she was in pain. It's because she was probably two or three months out from death, 
and her organs, you know, your organs start degenerating mm. in the death process. It's not a fast process for many people. And with that comes a lot of pain. And she'd ring the bell for them to come, and they're busy, they're under, no matter how much money it costs to put them in there, they're, uh, they're, they looked like they were still understaffed for their bu the budget that they allotted. And she'd be lying there in pain waiting for them to come, and I'd have to go get them and say, look, she's in pain, she needs pain pills. But I wasn't always there. I was living in Arizona and just visiting. Um, so, I mean, she suffered, and, I, and she was so out of it. You know, she had dementia as well as dying of old age. Mm -hmm. you know, there was no quality of life there for her. It would have been so much better for her and so much pa more pain-free had she been able to take advantage of your mm -hmm. services. Well, she, you know, I hear this story a million times. I mean, it's, it's very, very sad. Because, by the way, we're very, very uh, positive towards hospice care. We recommend it for people. One of the standard questions we ask is, have you considered hospice? Uh, because hospice is less concerned or not concerned with treating the condition as providing palliative, helpful comfort care, helping the person to be comfortable. And we, we recommend that. Now. Your mother could have contacted us, and assuming things that sound pretty likely to have occurred, she could have uh, gone home and died comfortably and quickly. One of the reasons that we send speakers like myself around is to raise awareness so we can avoid that kind of situation. If you get into the situation where you're sick and elderly and dying and there's no hope, look, if you got real sick, and you had to go through some serious treatment, maybe some surgery, whatever. But you knew that after you went through it, you'd recover and you'd go back and enjoy life again. Cool, you're willing to do it, you're willing to do the suffering. But what if you're in a condition where you know it ain't gonna happen? No matter what you go through, you're never again gonna be able to enjoy life because of conditions. Then you might choose to say, okay, I don't wanna go through that medical treatment. I'm willing to, I've led a good life, I've led a full life, time to say goodbye. I think that's a choice that intelligent people, humanists especially, should be able to make. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, while I'm on your way to there, my mother is currently going through the hospice process. And Could you stand? I can't see who's speaking. Oh, I'm back here. I got the oh, mic. Hi, <laughs> my mother's currently going through the hospice process oh. and is stuck in a situation where the hospice is not allowing that type of care uh, because they're a Christian organization. So. Nice to hear. Thank you. <laughs> Any other? Yep. Okay, this is about my mother. Mm -hmm. She was arrested for her attempt. She was and this what? is in Arizona. What about your mother? I didn't get that. My mother was arrested for her attempt, and this is in Arizona. She was arrested for? For her suicide attempt. For a suicide attempt. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, a really weird thing. I don't think that it is against the law to commit suicide. In, in Arizona or any other state. I'm hearing something different now. This is news to me. Um, was there somebody trying to help her? That's the thing that No, there wasn't, no. I don't know the answer. So. Mm -hmm. I know it, it had been against the law to attempt suicide, mainly for relig religious people who got that passed. But that's been done away with, as far as I know, in all 50 states, but maybe not uh, from what we just heard. Um, are there particular places that are uh, progressive and open and uh, working towards uh, making sure that these types of policies are in place on a, so he asked what was going bad from a state perspective. Are there any places that are particularly good? Well, and like I say, there are half a dozen states now in the District of Columbia where uh, they recognize that physicians can play a useful role in helping people to end their lives. Uh, and it is an active movement in, in many other states. I might mention, uh, several years ago, I attended a conference of the World Federation of Right to Die Societies in Chicago, and there were like 30 different countries represented. Um, Physician-assisted death is, is legalized in, in uh, several countries, uh, Switzerland, the Netherlands, Belgium, um, some other places, and there are active movements uh, even in uh, Colombia in South America and other countries. Even just recently I heard about in China, 
and possibilities of uh, legalizing assisted dying. Uh, so it's a movement whose, whose time has come, and I think 50 years from now, we're going to look back at this, and we're going to feel this. People are going to feel the same way they felt about it. You had to wait to 1863 to do away with slavery? Come on. What's wrong with you guys? We have time for one more question. All right. Hi. Um, Hi. I, one time a few years ago, I went to a meeting we were having to talk about um, dig death with dignity here in Arizona, and there was a legislator there, I can't remember her name, but she was talking about how when people were in hospice or they're dying, a lot of times doctors would not prescribe pain pills, even though they were in a lot of pain, because that can hasten death or or that not giving, that pain prolongs life, actually, and can keep people alive longer. And so the doctor, some doctors will not prescribe pain pills for fear that they're hastening right. their death. Yeah, that's a really a sad situation, in my opinion. Uh, physicians are trained to keep people alive, and you know the Hippocratic oath that they take says that they will not use anything to hasten death. It, it's, it gets complicated. Of course, that was created some 2,500 years ago by a fellow named Hippocrates. Uh, things have changed a little bit in that time. You would think that we'd make our laws be a little bit more uh, in, in tune with, with the present reality. But doctors are in a real quandary about that. They may be sympathetic. They may be uh, wanting to help. They may be recognizing that the help they're providing is absolutely useless and just continuing the pain. But legally, they're bound. So there, there are very many courageous doctors who are willing to um, sidestep it a little bit, let's say. And for them, we're very, very grateful. But they shouldn't have to be subjected to that kind of risk. I think I heard that was the last question. That was, yes. So I want to thank you all for being here, and I appreciate the chance to meet with you. <laughs> and we have a tradition here at HSGP to thank our speakers as we mug them. So congratulations and thank you very much for coming. We certainly appreciate it. You call this pay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. Please join me in giving a round of, another round of applause to our speaker today. It was a fantastic speech. Once again, we are meeting here uh, in, in two weeks, but we have a number of events as, uh, that I'll be putting up on the screen here shortly. Um, please also, if you're interested in lunch, come talk to my, myself or Richard. We'll be happy to help you get to the restaurant. Also, there is a board meeting today at 1230 if you're interested in sitting in uh, and also talking to us about potentially stepping up as the, uh, our member at large. Please come talk to myself or Pam right up here. Pam, if you wave your hand. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.